Good morning, folks. How y'all doing? Doing okay? Yeah? Doing great? Yeah? Well, let's do a few questions, okay? Just sort of recap what we did last week. Um, let me zoom in here. This is an old test, like from last semester, but please, if you have it, don't look at it. Let's just try it. Uh, let's see. Let's try this one, number eight. By the way, the old tests are a good way to practice for the exams. The exams aren't the same, but they're similar, especially last semester. Uh, when light travels from a vacuum to a medium, it necessarily does which of these. If it goes from some vacuum to a medium, or if we can think of the movement from air, say, to a medium like glass, where the index of refraction is larger. When light travels from a vacuum to a medium, which of these does it do? Speed up or down? Does it spin or travel straight? Ask your neighbor what they put. Y'all are sort of spread around. Uh, so ask your neighbor, please. What does it necessarily do? What does it necessarily do? All right. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop at 110. 110. Just guess if you're not sure. Let me ask you this. Imagine, like we have two scenarios where it can move from a vacuum to a medium. Say this is our vacuum, this is our medium, like glass or whatever. We can have two ways that this light can travel. It can travel in this direction, where it goes straight, or it can travel at an angle, right, where it comes up with some angle to the, uh, the perpendicular line. We call that the normal line. Try this question again. Which of these must necessarily do? In both of these cases, which of these is it going to do? Is it going to speed up? Is it going to slow down? Is it going to bend? Or will it travel straight? In which of those cases, both of those cases, will it do uh, one of those four options? All right, just a few more seconds, OK? Uh, same question. I'm going to stop at, say, uh, 40 seconds. 40 seconds. If you're not sure, just guess. 40 seconds. All right, are y'all clicking in? Did y'all click in again? This is the same question, but it's the second time. So if you didn't click in the second time, please do that. All right. All right it looks like we're the same distribution. All right, just a second. I'll stop at 55. All right, B is the right answer. It will necessarily slow down. Uh, it will not necessarily bend, though in some cases it will bend. For example, here, uh, the light coming from a vacuum to a certain medium like glass, it will bend. Which direction will it bend? Will it bend A, towards the normal, or B, away from the normal? When I say normal, all that means is a perpendicular line. And the perpendicular line is just this line right here. So is it going to bend A towards the normal like that, or is it going to, this is A, or will it bend B away from the normal? Oops. Away from the normal like this. So this would be option B. Which will it be? Will it bend towards the normal or away from the normal? Doing pretty well. Not everybody has the right answer, but most of you. If you're not sure, just ask your neighbor what they put. I'm going to stop at 50 seconds. 50. A is the right answer. That's very good. Um, remember, we can think about our wave fronts traveling here. If I have, think of this, uh, this light made up of wave fronts. And then when it reaches here, it slows down, and that causes this side of the wave front to sort of turn around like that, like a marching band. And so it enters this new medium that's going to bend towards the normal. I, I would expect some questions like that on the exam. How does light behave when it goes from one medium to another, based on the index of refraction? 
Let's try another one here. Um, I want you to rank these in order from smallest to biggest energy. Gamma rays, infrared, microwaves, and ultraviolet. I want you to rank them from order of smallest to biggest energy. With these ranking questions, you can eliminate, eliminate uh, some options. So the smallest, these say, are microwaves, infrared, or gamma rays. So if you know that some of those aren't the smallest energy, you can get rid of them. Remember, microwaves are just a subset of what type of wave, or sub, what type of light. Microwaves, radio waves, yeah. Microwaves are sort of almost very close to the frequency out of your cell phone. In fact, they found that with prolonged cell phone use, that part of your head sort of gets slightly heated just from the radiation from your cell phone. It doesn't hurt you. I don't think. I recommend it. Okay, write these in order from smallest to biggest energy. We're right, doing very well on this. I'm going to stop at 110, 110. Excellent. A is the right answer. Microwaves or radio waves are the lowest energy. Next, we have infrared, ultraviolet, and then gamma rays are the highest energy. All right, if I was ranking these from uh, longest to shortest wavelength, that would be the same here. This would be longest to shortest wavelength. Now, what about frequency? How would this be ranked in frequency? Would it be uh, smallest to biggest or biggest to smallest frequency? All right, this has a very big wavelength, so it has a very small frequency. All right, no follow me. So the frequency here is very, very small, and here the frequency is very, very big. This comes about from that relationship that we had last time in the previous chapter, that V is equal to lambda times the frequency. So if the wavelength goes up, as it does for microwaves, that means the frequency goes down. Because all of these travel at a particular speed, right? When it's traveling through a medium, I mean through a vacuum, and that's that speed of light, three times 10 to the All right, what is, uh, let's see if I have one of these. to that yet. Okay, I'm pretty sure we did this. Didn't we talk about how light travel? Yeah, we did. Uh, which of these is the path that light would take? If, if it comes in right here, which of these would it take? Would it be shifted over in this direction? Would it continue on straight? Or would it be shifted over in that direction? It's moving from air into a slab of glass. What is the path that it would take? It's similar to a previous question as to whether the light bends towards or away from the normal light and what happens to it. Didn't we talk about this last time? How light travels too much. Let me help you out a little bit. Remember, uh, many of you got the right answer. I was not enough of you that I like. Uh, when this goes uh, into the glass, which way is it going to bend? Is it going to bend towards that dashed line, the normal line, or is it going to bend away from the dashed line? Towards or away? Can you try again? Towards, right, towards. It bends towards the line. Remember, I have. I do my uh, wave front here, it's going to slow down. That means this side is going to rush around because it's moving faster. And so this light ray is going to bend towards that normal line. So rethink your answers. Many of you have the right answer, a lot of A of you do not. So what's going to happen when it goes through this round of class? I'm going to stop at 205. 
All right, uh, so when it moves here, it bends towards the line, and then it goes up here, and then it bends away from the normal line. And remember, as we talked about in class, that these two lines, this ray and this ray right here, are parallel to one another. So they're at the same angle with respect to the normal line. It's just like this ray is shifted over to here. I actually brought a slab of glass today. I'm going to pass it around. Uh, I'm going to turn all the lights out. I'm not sure how you'll be able to see this, but I'll pass it around so you can see it just a bit. So this is just a, it's a piece of plastic, just a slab of plastic. And if I run this through straight, I see the light ray just goes straight, right? Uh, it's not refracted at all. The light does slow down when it enters the glass, but it doesn't slow down. Can y'all see the light inside the plastic back there? Juana, can you see, sort of? I'm going to pass it around in just a second. Now notice what happens as I bend it. Uh, you might not be able to see, but the, the ray that's coming out is slightly offset. And then you also see, and again, I'll pass this around so you can play with it, but you can see that the ray inside of the glass is bent away from the, the path that it travels as it's going in. Right, let me pass it around. You'll be able to see it better at your desk. Uh, but what you want to do is first try having it go in that direction and then try bending it. And then you can see how the light ray actually bends when it enters the glass. And further, you can see uh, that the ray coming in is slightly offset from the ray coming out. And then you can practice with having different angles. It works better with the green. There's a red and a green. There are two buttons. Uh, but it works better with the green. And also, it's not a real strong laser, but don't point it at anybody. Okay. I took it to my, my middle school team, my math team, and they were all pointed in their faces and stuff, but you don't want to shine it in your room. It's not a good thing. Okay? But it's not a terribly strong thing. So. I'm going to leave the lights off for just a couple of minutes, okay? You okay with it? I'm sleeping. I can't even sleep as well. All right. Uh, let's do a couple more. Sort of to recap. Okay, here I have light that moves from glass to water. What happens to the light here as it moves from glass to water? Again, is it towards the normal, away from the normal? Does it travel straight or does it reflect off of the water? I'm going to stop at 45. 45, 45. All right, B is the right answer. And actually, D, nobody put D, but as we all know that if you, if you do shine uh, a light onto the surface of the water, you will get a reflection back, right? Is that true? Yeah. You, does have, you can actually see it when you have the, the, uh, the glass and you shine the laser into it. There is a point where the light will reflect back upon itself within the glass. So, uh, we're not going to talk about that concept, but it's called total internal reflection. And that's the, the idea behind uh, fiber optic cables. Let's see here. We did, where exactly did we leave off last time? I don't have it in my electronic type. Oh, we're talking about lenses, right. The different types of lenses. Um, oh, good. Okay, so we're at focal point. So we talked about two different kinds of lenses. Did we talk about uh, converging versus diverging? We did or did not? Yeah, so this is a converging lens. All right, I have light rays that come in parallel. Did I draw this figure for y'all last time? Yeah? Yes, okay. The way that the, the bending of light occurs here, the refraction, is such that these will focus at a certain point. And then a diverging lens looks like this. 
and these light rays will diverge. So that's the difference. This is a converging. You might already have this, but I'm just going to reiterate. This is a converging lens. This is a diverging lens. Uh, the converging is called a what? Is it concave or convex? Right, this is convex. And diverging is a concave. All right, the convex and the concave, that refers more to the shape of the lens than what it does. Uh, and so I always think of the concave as being, it sort of looks like a cave. It's sort of caving in. It's sort of roughly how they're named based on their shape. And convex, I don't know exactly what convex means. But. My laser make it all the way around? I'll turn the lights back on. Are you just playing, Patrick? Or just... Okay. Did y'all get to see it? Oh, okay. It didn't come up. All right. I'll leave the lights off for just a second. Um, okay. So I want to show you now the focal point. There are a couple different things that we describe with these convex and concave mirrors. Uh, first of all, you just want to think about how these things are made. So like, for example, a convex mirror, I can imagine as being the intersection of two spheres. So if I were to have two big spheres of glass and I squish them together, and then some way I was able to take out this piece, that would be a convex lens, a convex or a converging lens. Right? It has two spherical sides. Each side is a, a spherical surface. Now, obviously, this isn't how they make convex lenses. They don't squish spheres together and then carve out the middle. They take a piece of glass and, or a piece of plastic. They might form it in a mold, or they might grind it with a, a, an abrasive material or, or a brush or whatever. Um, but you want to think of this idea that the convex lens is made up of two spherical purpose, uh, two spherical surfaces. Now, as a result, it has a point here. This is called the center of curvature. And this point right here is called the focal point. And the focal point is one half of the center of curvature. We're going to call this center of curvature C, and we'll call the focal point F. So the focal point has a physical meaning. It's half of the radius of the sphere out of which you cut this lens. Right. Similarly with diverging lenses or concave lenses, if I were to think about my concave lenses, instead of having two spheres that are sort of smooshed together, I have two spheres that are apart. And then this shape is the shape of the concave lens. All right. And so in a similar way, I have a center of curvature here. This is my C. And then this is my focal point, F. So the focal point is half the center of curvature. But the focal point has a different meaning as well. And this is usually the meaning that we ascribe to it. Right? So the focal point is half of the radius of the sphere out of which you cut this lens, or the concave or convex lens. But the focal point is also where rays focus. And that's why we call it the focal point. So focal point is the point where light rays focus. All right, so for example, if I have a convex lens, if I have light rays that come in, we know they focus, they focus at the focal point. I can also uh, create images, or so with a concave lens, rather, if I have light rays that come in, what does a concave lens do to the light rays? What does a concave lens do to the light rays? Somebody said it. It spreads them apart. It's a diverging lens, so it causes light rays to diverge. So these rays diverge, but they diverge in such a way that if we were to draw the focal point back here, we would trace them back to the focal point. So for 
uh, a concave and a convex lens, the focal point is where these light rays will focus. Now, what is common about the light rays from both of these? How are the incoming light rays oriented with respect to one another? How are the light rays oriented with respect to one another? They're parallel. Thank you. Yeah, so these rays are parallel. So I want to add that qualifier here. The focal point is the point where parallel light rays will focus. Because we'll find, actually, that light rays that are not parallel don't focus at the focal point. It's only light rays that are parallel. Let me show you an example. We're not going to get a whole lot into ray tracing diagrams. We do that a lot in the other physics class, but not in this class so much. But it's still useful to just see it and sort of think about how these light rays travel through a lens. Let's say that I have a lens like this. This is one focal point, and this is another focal point. And then I have an object over here. This is my object. Uh, let's see. If I have a light ray that comes parallel to the axis like this, have a light ray like that, it's going to pass through the focal point like that. Now, I have a whole series of rays that emanate outward from this object, right? Like I'm standing here, and there are a bunch of light rays that are coming from me to you, and that's how you can see me and see other things in the room. But there are light rays being reflected off of the light fixture onto the person and into your eye. So I don't just have this one ray that's coming from this object. I have tons of rays that are coming from this object. So I can draw another ray. I'm going to draw one that goes through the focal point on the other side. I'm going to start here and draw a ray like that. And then this ray, if it goes through the focal point on one side of the lens, what direction do you think it'll travel on this side of the lens? Do you think that it'll go up? Do you think that it'll go straight? Or do you think that it'll go down? What direction do you think? Can we go? Down. <laughs> uh, what it's going to do actually is it's going to go parallel. So light, light always has this. I what they call it. Uh, they have a theorem. Basically, if it goes one direction, if it goes in one way in one direction, when you do it the opposite, it's just going to trace back on itself. So say for example, if I ran my light ray from this point and it went up here, then it would go parallel. But then you come out a light ray that goes through the focal point on this side, it's going to go parallel on the other side. You'll see that what I mean that it runs backwards from the way that it went. Don't worry about ray tracing diagrams that much. We'll get into it a little bit more later. But I just want to sort of show you this now. All right, so that ray is going to go parallel. And now my image, if I draw an axis down the middle of the lens, that's called the optical axis, by the way. My image now, where it was up here, will be down here. All right. Is this image a real or a virtual image? Is it A, a real image, or is it B, a virtual image? I just created this image. All right, I can create all sorts of images. I can create real images and virtual images. But is this image a real or a virtual image that I've created with this convex lens? Remember our definitions of real and virtual. A real image can be what? Huh? I think so. Did we not? Oh, I'm very sorry. Um, let me check. OK, well, let me describe to you. I'm going to leave it running. I'm going to describe to you a real and a virtual image. A real image is an image that you can project onto a screen. A virtual image is an image that you only see. You see both of them, right? You can see a real image and you can see a virtual image. But there's a difference. The real image you can project onto a screen, and the virtual image you just don't, you can't project it onto a screen. So, for example, a flat mirror, what, what kind of image does that produce? A real or a virtual image? A flat mirror, like your bathroom mirror. Can you project that image onto a screen? No. So, what type of image is that? It's a virtual image. What about this image? Can you project this image onto the screen? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And if you can, it's a real image. If not, it's a virtual image. All 
OK, I'm going to pass around something. So this is a convex lens, right? It's made up of two spheres. So when you get it, just sort of look around at it. Uh, it is made up of two spheres. There's one side that's curved and this side, one side here. Uh, if I hold it so that this is like a screen, if I hold the light, I can get a pretty clear image of the light on the paper. And then, yeah, I can see like details and that the hatch pattern on the light or what have you. So I'm going to pass this around and you can show how you can make this type of image with this convex lens. Uh, the focal point of this lens, by the way, is about 20 centimeters, so the focal point is right about here. But if I were to cut this into a big sphere, it would be a sphere that would be about this big, right? And that half the radius would be right about right here, so about 15, 20 centimeters. So now, we're just going to save it and we can make an image on this sheet of paper of the light. And try to get it so that you can see the detail of the, uh, the light that you're making. I'm going to turn on the lights for this. A lot of light. All right. Okay, that didn't help very much. So, is this a real or a virtual image? Like, that's the same thing that we're doing here, right? I have an object. In this case, if you're looking at the right picture, you'll see it when it comes up. I have an object that you can focus the light through a lens, and then you hold a sheet of paper on the other side. And then you see that object, an image of that object. Is this a, a real or a virtual image? And for real images, you can project onto a screen. Virtual images, you cannot project onto a screen. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to stop at 340. 340. That is right. Let me write what I've said. Uh, real images. These are projected onto a screen or can be projected onto a screen. Virtual images, on the other hand, cannot be projected onto a screen. Good example of virtual image, like I said, is the mirror, the image of yourself in the mirror. You can, there's no way to hold up a screen and project that image of yourself uh, onto the screen. Now you can hold up a sheet of paper and shine a flashlight onto the mirror, and the light will bounce off and reflect, and you can, you know, show that light on the uh, on the wall or whatever. You might have done that before, but you're never going to create a sharp image the way that you can with this. You all see in the, the image of the light picture that you see it. You can actually see the, the details on the, uh, the plastic here. We sort of have those lines, those hatch lines. Please be careful with the lens. That's the last one I have so far. Uh, let's see. Can I show something with the lens right quick as well? What type of, uh, when you look at this lens, what do you think of? Like, where have you seen the lens? Okay, yeah, these types of lenses are used in cameras. In fact, they're used in projectors like this as well. But like, what if I were Sherlock Holmes and I got a lens like this? A magnifying glass. So this is a magnifying glass. So if I hold the object uh, so that the object is outside the focal point, I create a real image. But I can also use it if I put the object inside the focal point, like this, and this, I look at my finger and it looks huge. Okay? This is a magnifying glass, and this is a case where I have a virtual image. I want to draw on the board for a second. But this is a case where I have a virtual image. So when you're doing this, you can do the real image, and then look at your finger if you're here, and it looks really big. If my eye looks really big, what's it? Yeah, it looks really big. And that's a virtual image. It cannot be projected. Let me show you the ray diagram for that. And again, don't sweat the ray diagrams too much. Uh, don't think, no, we're not really going to get into ray diagrams. But they're useful to help you sort of see the images, I think. So, for example, let's say that I had a lens like this. 
here's my focal point here and here. But let's say that I have an object here. Right? I can imagine two rays coming off of this. I'm going to have a ray that goes parallel to the axis like that, and then it'll bend through there. And then I'm going to draw another ray that looks like it originates from the focal point, and it's going to go parallel. Don't sweat the rules for how I've drawn these, but what I do want you to notice here is that there is no image on this side of the lens. This is like me holding my finger in front of the, uh, the lens, but it says that there's no image because these rays, they never cross on this side of the lens. So there's no real image on this lens. However, if I trace the rays back in this direction, they cross here, and this is my image. It's called a virtual image. All right, so there's no real image on this side. You can't project that image onto the screen, but there is a virtual image, and that's the image that you see of your finger inside the magnifying glass. All right? So with convex lenses, you can produce both real and virtual images. I have another real image I want to show you. I'll pass it around. There's lots of cool things. All right. This is made with a mirror. We don't get into mirrors here, but a lot of the same stuff applies for lenses and mirrors. Anybody ever seen one of these? First of all, uh, this is called a concave mirror, but it works a lot like a convex lens. Can y'all see yourself? How do you look? You're upside down, yeah. A lot like the image that we had here, where the object is upright, and the image here is known as the upside down. All right, so that's the same idea as you seeing yourself upside down. See yourself right there? Or, all right, you can take it apart when I pass it around, and you can see it. Now, this is a little pig, and this is a set of two mirrors here. When you pass it around, I want you to look for your little pig. Okay? You ever seen one of these? So when you look for the pig, sort of look back from this direction. Oh, no, you can look like this, but look from this direction. Alright, now that's not a classic real image because you can't really project that onto a screen, uh, but it's sort of like a real image. It's, you can sort of see it not as a virtual image. Alright, um, Okay, so converging lenses convex are converging lenses can produce either virtual this is when the object is inside the focal point or real images. It produces real images like the lens and the light when the object is outside the focal point. Just to recap, I'm not going to draw the rays, but I just want to show you. If I have an object right here, my image is over here. This is my object. This is my image. If I have an object inside the focal point right there, my image is right here. So this is my object. This is my image. This will become important later when we talk about classes and sort of how they correct it. Uh, I'll turn the light off and it's easier to see. So convex lenses can produce either virtual or real images, depending upon where the object is relative to the uh, you know, relative to the focal point. Can I go down from here, y'all? Okay. 
Uh, on the other hand, concave lenses are diverging, not divergent like the book, but diverging. Have you seen the movie? Is it any good? Did you read the book? No. Was it good like the book? All right, concave lenses only produce virtual images. All right, so if I have a concave lens like this, oh, let's see, how does it go? It doesn't matter where the object is. So like if my object is here, my image will be a virtual image. You probably notice something here that real images are always what? Opposite or on the same side as the object? Real images. Are they always on the same side or opposite the object? They're always opposite the object. I'll write that as a more in a second. But real images are always opposite the object. On the other hand, virtual images are always what? Opposite or on the same side as the object? On the same side. Let me write that down. So real images are always opposite the object. Virtual images are always the same side as the object. Right. This is only with one lens system. If you have two or more lenses, you can have you can change this. But we're not going to have two lens systems. Uh, we're just going to deal with like eyeglasses, and, and those only have one lens. All right. The, uh... right, we are going to skip something in your book. I just want to point this out. Uh, let's see, where is it? Hopefully, we're not going to do the lens maker's equation. So we're in chapter six. Remember, we are. What are we doing on Thursday? Right, we're doing a quiz. So uh, on. We're going to skip the part on page 191, sort of where it says lenses can be made to have a certain focal length. Here, it looks like this on your page if you're following along. It's the lens maker's equation, and we're going to skip all that, that sort of half page. Yeah, just sort of that half a page. The lens maker's equation. This just tells you if you want to make a lens with a certain focal length, what radius do you need to give those two spheres? So people that make lenses, they go to this and they, they ask what is the index of refraction and what are the radii of the surfaces that they want to make a certain focal length. Right. We're not going to get into that though. Um, we do talk about the power of a lens. You might have heard this, especially if you wear glasses or you go to the optometrist. The power of a lens. Uh, it describes the strength of the lens. lens with a larger power will cause light to bend more. All right, so let's try this. I'm going to give you two lenses. I want you to tell me which one has more power. Is it this lens that's long and skinny? Or is it this lens that's sort of short and round? Which one of these has more power? That is, which one of these will cause light to bend more? I think that you probably know this, but let's see. So which one of these lenses will cause light to bend more?
Okay, most of you have the right answer. You can ask around your neighbors if you like. Not nine of you have the right answer. It's three or four of you do not. And now we're about half. Fifty percent. So ask your neighbors. You might not know this right off. I want to see. Okay, pretty good. Let me stop at one minute. See, yeah, B is right. B will cause the light to bend more. Light rays that come in will just be bent more than they are by the thin lens. Right? Uh, how do their focal lengths compare? Which of the one, of, which one of these has the longer focal length? So this one, this one has more power. Has a hot power is bigger for this one. And by the way, this is a different term from the power that we use uh, for energy and work, right? Remember we said power was energy per ton? This has nothing to do with that. This is a completely different thing. But this lens number B has a higher power. Which one of these has the longer focal length, A or B? Based on their shape, A is very thin, B is sort of round. Uh, which one of these has the longer focal length? Remember, the focal length is the half of the radius of the sphere out of which your lens was cut. So if you think about these being spheres extending out on either side, which one of those spheres is bigger? Which one has the longer focal length? I got a good joke. I want to tell it to you. It's an excellent joke. And my kids rolling in the aisles. You can ask your neighbor if you like. I'll stop at one minute. Which one has the longer focal length? That is, if I were to extend these out in the spheres on either side, which which sphere would have a bigger diameter, a bigger radius, and a bigger focal length? All right, I'll stop at one time. A is right. If I extend this out into spheres, right, the one on the left here has a really big sphere. The focal point would be, I don't know, right about here maybe. But over here, these are sort of rounder spheres, but not as big. And so the focal point here would be pretty close, or not even there. It would be like inside the lens. All right, y'all follow me on that? Okay, so the one on the right had more power, had a higher power rating, and the one, and it also had the lower focal point, lower focal point. So how then is power related, thank you, how is power related to focal point? If the focal length goes up, what happens to the power? Does it go up or down? It goes down. So if the focal length goes up, as it does in A, that means that the power goes down. If the focal length increases, the power decreases. That's why somebody who needs really strong lenses, they're really thick lenses. I mean, now they can make thin lenses that still have a very short focal length. But if, your eye, if you need a lot of correction for your eyes, the lenses that you use are really thick because you have to have a lens with a lot of power to bend the light, a lot more than another lens that doesn't have as much power. And in order to have a lot of power, you have to have a short focal length, which means you need a very round lens. So if the focal length goes up, the power goes down, and then conversely, if the focal length goes down, the power goes up. As I said, this is like uh, for people with extremely poor vision, that have very thick lenses, so their lenses can be quite thick. Because they need very high-powered lenses, which have a short focal length, which are going to be sort of very thick in the middle like these. Can I tell you the joke anyway? Yeah. No, you go ahead. I'm sure you're wrong. Yeah, let me redraw them, okay? Let me go to the next page. 
so uh, I have two lenses. I mean, that one's sort of uh, long and thin. And if I, I think about these lenses being cut out of spheres, because they are, Right, so I think about this this side right here being part of a bigger sphere that extends over here. That's not a very good circle. But the center of curvature is there, and the focal length is there. All right. Now conversely, go to the next page. Or no, I'll just do it here, but I'm going to do it in a different color. So if instead I have a lens that's really thick in the middle, and that's basically a sphere. Um, I have a lens that's very thick in the middle. If I think about these extended out as a sphere, see just extending this side out is part of a circle. This one has a center of curvature that's right about there. And then the focal length is half of that center of curvature, which is going to be there. Basically, if it's thicker in the middle, it has a smaller focal length. Because that sphere is cut out of a, a smaller, or that lens is cut out of a smaller sphere. sphere. So it has a shorter uh, focal length. Does that answer your question? Uh, what, uh, well, what did the janitor say when he jumped out of the closet? I don't know what. <laughs> Supplies! <laughs> That was, that, was, that was a good one. All right. Um, let's look at the... Uh, oh, so I don't think I ever said this. So the power then is given by this expression. Right? Because if our focal length goes up, that means our power goes down. If our focal length goes down, that means our power goes up. So we define our power based on this. It's measured... You've probably heard this. What is power of a lens measured in? You know, everybody go to the optometrist. It's measured in di diopters. Thank you. The power of a lens is measured in diopters, and it's just the inverse of the focal length. Okay, let's look at the thin lens equation. The thin lens equation, if you ever go into a, a field where you're dealing with, with lenses at all, you're likely to see this. Uh, it's given as 1 over di plus 1 over do. Remember, these are the image distance. And this is the object distance. Sometimes these are given as p and q. The image distance is di, the object distance is do. This is equal to 1 over the focal length. Uh, I don't think we're going to have any calculations for this. In just a second, I think about this. I haven't done this in the past. No. All right. Um, For most, for most devices, optical devices, we change either the image.
image distance or the object distance. All right, it's a little more complicated than this magnifying glass, but not a whole lot more complicated. Like with this, if you want to look at your finger, you sort of move the lens around so you got a nice focused image, right? You don't do this. Or also when you're looking at the, the, uh, the lights, you sort of move it so you've got a nice focused image. What you're doing there is you're, you're changing either the object distance, which is the distance between the object and the lens, or you're changing the image distance, which in this case is the distance between you know, the, uh, the paper and the lens. So if you change those, you can uh, find a point where you get a nice focused image. And they're based on this relationship, the, lens, the uh, thin lens equation. So we're not going to do any calculations on this. Uh, the fractions aren't terribly difficult, but you'll probably have enough fractions in a while. Is that right? Do you like doing fractions? You don't care? No, you don't. Okay. We won't do any calculations for this. Um, all right. So if you want to see, let's, let's go with this. So I'm going to write the thin lens equation up here. 1 over di plus 1 over do equals 1 over f. All right. In the human eye, one of these is fixed, one of these quantities. Which one is fixed in the human eye? It doesn't change. Is it di, do, or f? The human eye is a lot like this, right? It's just a convex lens. It's a little more complicated, but not much more. It's just a convex lens, a single convex lens. Right. Now, the focal point isn't fixed. What's fixed? It's a good thing the focal point isn't fixed. But, uh, then we wouldn't be able to see. We'd just be able to see like one of the distance. It's fixed. Right, PI. You can get distance from the lens to, your, to the retina, which we'll get into what that is later. But you'll probably know what the retina is. It's where that image is projected. It's like the screen. So in the human eye, di is fixed. The image distance All right, the human eye looks like this. It's a convex lens, basically a spherical shape. And the distance between the lens and where the image is projected onto the back of the eyeball, that's our di. And this doesn't change. So, if you want to look at something up close, close, something's going to have to change, right? Like, so if I have this and I have it far away, and then I move it closer, and I still want to see it, what's going to change? If my di stays the same and I change my do, what has to change in order for me to have to see, still be able to see the object at this object distance? If I make it smaller, what has to change? The focal point. So the focal point of your lens, this lens will actually change. That's the cool thing about the eye. But we don't really have devices that do this, but the eye will actually change the focal length of that lens. They all wear this? You've heard this before, right? Yeah. There are little muscles in it that can squeeze the eyeball down or, or make it thinner. And that changes the focal point. It changes that, the physical dimensions of that. So if I move something close, does F a increase? decrease. What happens? If I move something close, according to this thin lens equation, if I move it so that the object distance is smaller, what happens to my focal point? Does my focal point increase or does it decrease? Okay, 
we're, we're pretty evenly split. Now remember, let's, let's look at this not as like a, a, an equation, but as relationship between different variables. I've already told you that, that this remains constant, right? That image distance. So I can just sort of take it out of the picture because it's not going to change. That 1 over di term isn't going to change. So basically what I have is these terms, 1 over do, 1 over the object distance, and then 1 over the focal point. So if I make uh, something so that do is smaller, then what's going to happen to my focal length of the lens? <coughs> All right, doing sort of well. We're still sort of split about half and half. I'm going to stop at 120, though. Just a few more seconds. Ask your neighbor if you like. Okay. Um, so, if I cause DO here to decrease, what's going to happen to F? It's going to decrease as well. F will decrease. It has to, right? Because of this relationship. That if DO goes down, then F goes down as well. So as I move an object closer to my eye, does it get skinnier or fatter, the lens in my eye? Does it get skinnier or fatter? Now the focal length is going to decrease. It's going to get smaller. What's going to happen to my eye? Let's do that as a clicker question as well. Is the focal length, let's see, this was uh, V, right? If I move something closer to my eye, does my lens get skinny? Or does it get fatter in the middle? Which is it? Now, I already told you the focal length is going to get smaller, right? So what happens to the actual lens? How does the shape of that lens change? Does it get skinny in the middle, or does it spread out in the middle? Okay, good. Just a few more seconds. I'll stop at 20, at 30, 30 seconds. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, so a shorter focal length, skinny in the middle would look like this. Shorter focal length would look like that. So when you're looking at things up close, that lens will get squashed down, and it makes it thicker in the middle. We'll see that a little bit later and, and sort of how age affects that. Um, what is the focal length for an object that's very far away? So if I think about the eye, When I say very far away, what I mean is that the object is at infinity. That it's just, it's so far away, it's much bigger than the focal length of the lens or the image distance or any of that. So it's something at the back of the classroom or the sun or something like that. What is the focal length for an object that's very far away? Um, if I think about the eye here, the eye, and I have light rays that are coming in from an object that's very far away. Remember we talked about on the first day of this that if I have an object that's very far away by the time we those light rays get to us at a far distance away, it's like they're moving parallel to one another. Yeah? Alright, so what is the focal length going to be of this lens? Is it going to be at one of these locations? A, B, right in the middle there, C, D, all it be at the lens. Which of those, were, where will it be? The focal length of this, of the lens in your eye that can change, right? When you're looking at an object that's very, very far away. Ask your neighbor if you like. About seven of you have the right answer right now.
Everybody get to see the pig? Alright, I'm going to stop at 110. 110. Most of you have the right answer. Well, yeah, 110. Alright, when I have light rays that are parallel, where do they focus? For a lens, when the light rays come parallel to the lens, at what point do they focus? Can you describe this? It's a particular point on the lens. What's it called? Where do light rays focus? Right? That's why we call it the focal point. Because it's the point where light rays focus when they're parallel to the axis coming in. And so light rays coming in here will focus at the parallel uh, will focus at the focal point. So if we know where they're gonna cross, where these light rays are gonna focus, uh, where do they have to focus in order to create an image that we can see? At the back. Right, so these light rays, they have to focus at the back on the retina. So when the object distance is really big, when it's equal to infinity, the focal point is equal to the image distance. And that comes about from our lens equation, 1 over f equals 1 over di plus 1 over do. Because if do goes to some really big number, 1 over a really big number is equal to what? It's equal to zero, right? So that goes to zero. So then this comes about that f is equal to di. So our lens can change. When I'm looking at something that's really far away, my focal point is at the retina or at the back of the eyeball. And as I look at things that are closer and closer, my focal point gets smaller and smaller. So as I move this object closer and closer to my lens, my focal point moves back in this direction. Let me write that in words, just to make sure that it's clear. So, as objects move closer, focal point gets smaller. All right, so this focal point, if I have an object that's really far away, the focal point will be there. As it moves closer, my focal point will gradually move closer and closer to the actual lens as, that, as my object gets closer. So as objects move closer, the focal point gets smaller. When objects are in, at far away, focal length equals the image distance, which is the diameter of the eyeball. So as we'll see, this image distance, which is the diameter of the eyeball, is very important as to how our, our lens functions, how our eye functions. And so we'll talk about various conditions like farsightedness and nearsightedness, which largely are just due to the eyeball being misshapen. Either the eyeball is too long or the eyeball is too short. And then that changes where these images are created. We'll get into that probably in the next class period. Let's do get a little bit into the, the anatomy of the eye, though. Maybe my favorite organ, the eye. It's really cool because it can detect really bright levels of light. And then it can also detect really low levels of light. So if you were to put yourself into a room, and there was just a single photon, or maybe not one photon, but several photons of light inside that room, you would be able to detect them. Isn't that cool? Uh, we can build detectors that will detect single photons, but they're very specialized. They're called photomultiplier tubes, and they have to capture the photon, and they multiply the signal, and they turn it into an electrical signal. Uh, but those things, if you put them out in the sunlight, they're fried completely, because they, they don't have the same range as our eyeball. And also, you know, they don't have aging years like your eyeball does. Your eyeball has some problems as you get older, of course. But uh, for the most part, it operates pretty well over a long lifespan. So your eyeball is really pretty amazing. And of course, animals as well uh, have different levels of, of vision. Um, first of all, the eye is a sphere. 
loosely a sphere, we'll talk about how, like I said, some conditions the eye is not a sphere, and that causes some problems, which can be corrected with different lenses. Um, the sphere is filled with clear fluids. These are called the vitreous humor and the aqueous humor. We'll talk about later uh, where they are and what they do. It also contains the lens, the eye. And the ciliary body. Is that correctly? Is that two L really? No, that's right. The ciliary body will actually change the shape of the eye. Or excuse me, changes the shape of the lens. Uh, I have a, a diagram. I think there's a diagram in your book as well. I'll, I'll check while I pull it up. Um, I thought I had a diagram. Let's see here. No, I'm sorry. I guess I don't. I thought. I, oh, there's one. Uh, think on this exam that we had pulled up. I would be prepared to identify the various parts of the eye other students in the past have. So this is the eye. It's pretty much a sphere. Uh, we'll get into this later in the next class period. But this whole thing makes up the lens. This is the cornea and then this is the lens. But they work together to, to focus light onto the retina back here. This is the ciliary body right here. These are little muscles that are attached to the lens. And they can make it skinny or they can make it fat. And that's what causes you to be able to focus on things at different distances. So that's a picture of the eye. Uh, I think we will, I want to take you outside if it's sunny. Give me a second, I want to see if it's still sunny. I want to show you something before we wrap up. Do you want to pack up your stuff? Uh, we're going to just run. Uh, I don't want to show you something before we go outside.